Good evening. Um, I'm usually, uh, I, I don't usually uh, come here on Wednesday nights. I'm usually in the back with helping out with the teens and stuff. So, um, but I'm here. Uh, my dad asked me actually just yesterday, last night, um, if I wanted to preach tonight. And I said, sure thing. Thanks for the heads up. Uh, <laughs> and um, so, so yeah, I, I'll be preaching tonight. I'm actually going to be using one of one of the sermons that uh, I preached in my homiletics class uh, at school this last semester. So I've preached this sermon before. It's actually the one that I got the best grade on. So, uh, so uh, our text is going to be in Mark chapter two. Uh, we're going to look at Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Um, <clears throat> it says in verse number 1 there of chapter 2, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful day that, you get, that you've given us today. Thank you for allowing us to come together this evening uh, to worship you and, and to learn more about you. Uh, Lord, I pray that you just uh, bless this message, and I pray that you um, allow me to speak the right words. Um, and I pray that uh, everyone's hearts will be opened um, to your word this evening. Uh, I pray these things in your son's holy name I pray. Amen. Uh, friends are an amazing and wonderful gift that God has blessed all of us with. Um, I'd say that I have many friends. I, I, I'd say that I have a lot of friends. I'm a friendly person. Um, I have a lot of friends. But I have three best friends. Uh, Johnny Leslie, Isaac Wagers, and Amanda Warren. Um, I could tell you a ton of different stories um, of me and my friends and how wonderful they all are and all the fun that we've had. Um, I've been best friends with Isaac since the first grade, and we're still going strong. Um, Johnny became one of my best friends my freshman year of college. Him and his wife are the ones that I actually uh, visited a couple Sundays ago. His wife is the one that uh, played the piano for us. Um, and we were amazing friends. And then my friend Amanda and I, we became friends actually through COVID. Uh, we, we, kind of, we, we kind of knew each other just before COVID, but then through COVID we you know, maintained contact and we're best friends now. Um, <clears throat> fall semester of this last year, um, I lost a lot of friends through for, for different reasons here and there, um, but it impacted me negatively in, in a lot of ways. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not gonna delve into that, but, but I, I was not in a good spot. But I was so glad, and I am so glad, that uh, of the one friend that I did have with me, and that was Amanda. Um, she she was there she helped me and encouraged me uh, however and whenever she could and thanks to her i survived through the semester um i was so blessed to have her in my life and i am so blessed to have her in my life back to uh to our passage christ here uh had just recently started his ministry um, and at this point, uh, just after an instance where he had cast demons out of a man, um, his fame had grown across, across the land. Um, people had heard all about his miracles and his healings that he's done, so much so that there's hardly any room to breathe, right? And, but Jesus doesn't want the focus to be on the healing. That, that was a, a big part of what he did, but that wasn't what he wanted the focus to be on. He wants it to be on God. 
Which is why Mark, in this passage, in verse number 2, um, he focuses specifically on the fact that he's preaching in this house. So they're in this house, uh, Jesus is in there, and he's preaching God's word, and there's so many people that there is literally no room to get around. It's so full that you can't even get, the door, get in the door. That's how many people are in there. This passage that we're going to look at shows us just how impactful faith can be. Uh, and not even just our own faith, but the faith that other people have can affect us as well. The main point that I want to get across this evening, uh, that I want you guys to remember, the main point is, we as Christians not only need true friends in our lives, but we need to be those true friends to others. Do you have real true friends that you can rely on and confide in? Friends that can ultimately point you back to God in your time of need? Friends that will encourage you and edify you? Friends that can build you up? More importantly, though, are you that friend? The title of this message is What It Means to Be a True Friend. And my first main point, looking in verses 3 and 4, a true friend genuinely cares. He genuinely cares. He cares enough to persevere. Look at verse number 3. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. Sorry, that's verse number 4. I'm going to back up. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. So there are these four guys, and they have a friend who's sick of the palsy. He's paralyzed. He can't move. Right? And they try to go into this house, but as we said before... This house is so full, nobody can even get in the door. And so one of them says, hey, why don't we just climb up to the roof and lower him down to Jesus? Um, and so they do. They, they go up onto the roof, break it open, and lower him down. The idea here that these four guys cared so much about their friend, who is literally paralyzed, shows so much. You know, they took that time and that effort to help their friend. They cared so much that they began taking apart the roof of this house just so that they could see him walk again. They didn't let anything stop them from seeing their friend get healed. So th these, these friends care, a, a good friend cares enough to persevere through obstacles. But not only does a good friend care enough to persevere, but he also cares sacrificially. Right? Let's look back at verse number 4. When they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. These four guys sacrificed so much to get their friend healed. They got up to this house and began taking it apart. This was no easy task, mind you. Um, first, they had to get up onto the roof, which now it's, it's easier for them to get up on the roof than it would be for us because, you know, back in those days, they actually had a staircase that led to the roof from the outside. But they're still, the four of them are carrying a paralyzed person all the way up these stairs. And then even when they do get up onto the roof, they literally have to break apart this roof. It's not made of Legos or anything, which are, you know, made to be broken apart and then put back together. This roof was made to stay, and they're tearing it apart. Um, they had to literally break it op open. The owner of this house, he must have been furious afterwards, you know, these, these guys breaking a hole in his roof. But these friends, they didn't care. All they cared about was their friend. And, it, and it, the, how much they sacrificed, you know, of, of themselves um, and really of, of others to, to see their friend get healed. But it's also amazing to see just how much faith they had in this situation. 
right? If they were at all wrong about, you know, anything in this situation, or if Jesus wouldn't or couldn't, for whatever reason, heal their friend, they'd be in a tough spot, right? They just broke open the roof of this thing, of this house, lowered their friend all the way down so that Jesus could heal them. And if Jesus didn't heal him, all these people are around looking like it would be so embarrassing. And then their friend doesn't even get healed in the end. And then they have to take him out. How much faith they had. And that brings me to point number two. A true friend not only genuinely cares, but a true friend has strong faith. He has strong faith. Uh, strong visible faith. For one, um, verse number four. And when they could could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, "Son, thy sins be forgiven thee." Verse five there says that when Jesus saw their faith. He didn't know their faith or he didn't feel their faith. He saw it. These guys were radiating with faith. And it was because of their faith that the man was healed. And not just healed, saved. Right? Their, their faith was so strong right here that, that they, they truly believed that Jesus could heal him. They, they were expecting him to walk out of that house. That's how much faith they had. And Jesus saw that in them as they were lowering him down. Right? But he wasn't just healed. He was saved in this process. And so, not only does a true friend have strong visible faith, but he also, has, he, he also has strong faith in God. Right? More specifically, in God. Verse, verses 11 and 12 of this passage... It says, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. As I mentioned before, these guys were sacrificing a lot. If they were wrong about this at all, they would have been in a real pickle. You know, having lowering this paralyzed man all the way down, it would have taken them so much more effort to raise him back up and get out of there. But their faith in God was so strong that, as I said before, they were expecting their friend to walk out. It's a lot harder to pull something up out of a house than to lower it down. And the embarrassment that they would have had to suffer. But their faith in God was far stronger than any other thought. And this strong faith that these men had helped their friend in more than just healing. A true friend doesn't, have, doesn't just have strong faith, but also, point number three, a true friend points us to Christ. He points us to Christ. And these guys recognized that there was a problem, and only Christ could solve that problem. Christ solves the problems. He solves the problems. Look at verse number 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. We see here in verse 5 that uh, Christ does not heal this man initially. He's still paralyzed. Um, but Christ gets to the bigger and more important problem at hand. And that problem is sin. Uh, we as friends may not be able to see every single problem or every single solution to those problems. But Christ does. And it's important that, that we point our friends to Christ because he alone can heal us in, in the issues and he has the solutions to the real issues. 
Look at verse number 6. But there was certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived it in his spirit that they had so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Christ waits to heal the man because he's going to he heal him. Spoiler alert. Uh, he's going to heal him. But he waits until afterward to make a point. The Pharisees point out that man can't forgive sins. People, we as humans, we do not have the right, the capability. We don't, we're not able to forgive each other, truly to forgive each other of sins. Right? Only God has that right and capability. And so these Pharisees are like, hey, you're just a man and men can't forgive each other, for, for, forgive people of their sins. And then Christ responds essentially by saying, yeah, you're right, man can't do that. But man also can't heal paralysis by saying, just get up. And then he does that. Christ just shows them, hey, I am God. He proves them even further that he is God by saying, by, by you know, telling this paralyzed man to just get up. And that leads me to my next point is that um, not only, sorry, um, not only does Christ solve problems, but Christ is glorified when, you know, we lead our friends to, to Christ. He, he's glorified in the end. Verse number 12. It says, And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Ultimately, after everything that happens, God is the one who's going to be glorified. Uh, <laughs> the end result of all of this happening of, you know, his friends uh, breaking apart the roof, lowering him down to see Jesus, um, Jesus saving him, and then, you know, having him walk. The end result of all of that happening is God's glorification. All because a paralyzed man had four good friends. God is glorified in the end. Um, and that's something that, that, that we, we need to take into consideration is that as, as we are good friends to each other, we need to point, we need to point each other to Christ. We need to edify each other, build, up, build people up, and point them to Christ. And the reason for that is so that God gets the glory, right? Um, because as we point people to Christ, they will grow closer to Christ. We will grow closer to Christ. And in the end, it's all to glorify God. Because he's wonderful. Now, when I'm back up at school in Wisconsin, um, the church that I go to, um, it's, it's called Faith Baptist. Um, it's in Oconomowoc. And I love it. It's a great church. There is a family there. Um, husband, wife, and I believe they have around like 13 kids. Um, the youngest one is like a newborn. The oldest one is like a, t a teenager, like freshman or sophomore in high school. Um, and then kids scattered around all throughout the ages um, some have you know disabilities it's it's uh, it's, it's a situation um, the father in that family I think it's it's been a little over a year now 
maybe a bit longer than that. Um, he was diagnosed uh, with uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. And so, over the course of time, um, it just got worse and worse. He wasn't able to really do anything. And so it was up to the mom to not just, you know, take care of all 13 or so of these kids, but also she had to take care of her husband. And it, w it was a lot. Um, eventually he got, uh, you know, hooked up to machines and everything, keep him alive. And I think it was early March, late February, um, the family made the decision uh, to pull the plug. Um, and so that, that was you know a few months ago, but still be in prayer for that family. Uh, it's the Hatch family. Um, but I tell you this because I think, I think the week following that decision, um, someone had asked the oldest uh, son, Cameron, um, someone asked him if, if he's going to be okay, you know, but more specifically, they asked him, do you have good friends, like true, good, real friends that will help you and lead you in the right direction and, and keep you steady, keep you in the right place and, and, and not allow you to go down the wrong path? And he said, with full and complete confidence, yes, I am so blessed that God has given me the friends that I have, because I truly believe that they will help me down the right path. And it's, it's such a blessing to have good, true friends that we can rely on it's in, in those dark times. Psalm 1 1 said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. God gave us each other for a reason. Right? You know, back in Genesis when God made Adam. He said, it's, it's not right for man to be alone. He needs people. Um, and so, God, God literally made us for each other. We're here because we're supposed to be those true friends and lead each other to, to Christ. Um, and we're blessed when we're with the right people. And that's what that psalm said, is, is that blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. And so, I'm going to ask you again, do you have true, real friends that will point you in the right direction, point you towards Christ? Do you have those real, true, godly friends that, will, that, are, that are there for you and that support you? And, and that, you know, ultimately, um, encourage you and edify you, build you up. But more importantly, are you that friend?